Hey, thanks for joining me once again as we look at Planetary Issue 8. I say this every time I dig in one of these issues out. This is one of my favorite comic series ever, if not my most favorite. It just had a combination of everything that I kind of liked. Interesting story, new characters mixed with um, alternate takes on old concepts. Um, a great writer that knows how to tell... A, deep thoughtful story without crowding the pages with unnecessary text and an artist that started out amazing and just got better and better and better it just kept going and getting more amazing as every issue went along and all the story points that kept coming up they kept slowly building on to it and adding to it i was talking about in the last issue i was a little bit frustrated because the story took a little divergence and stopped talking about the main plot points that were the focus of the book to tell something else about kind of the state of um, the comic industry and characters in the 80s with the, um, like the, what is it, what do they call it? The European invasion, the certain writers and creators from Europe and, and, you know, England and stuff, places like that. And had a big old kind of something to say about that kind of uh, part of the comics industry with those creators. But and it was interesting and I enjoyed it. But I wanted to get back to the main story, which we do in this. But as I was kind of rereading it just before uh, starting this video, you know, I can't help but be reminded of how much, as much as we're back to the main story point and I'm ready to keep learning about what's going on in this world, Warren Ellis is doling it out in such small bits and pieces. It's both infinitely interesting and aggressively frustrating it's kind of interesting anyway planetary issue eight love this cover as i've said with every issue of planetary every cover has like a different cover treatment it's not uniform at all there's no one um like planetary logo that's the standard one like if you see x-men you know what that logo looks like or spider-man or spawn or whatever Planetary changes with every issue, and it's wild to think the kind of thought that has to go into that. Not only does the artist have to, you know, draw the book, he pencils, he inks, he has to produce a cover. I assume he has a lot of say in what's actually going on. This cover being kind of reminiscent of like a 1950s cheesy sci-fi movie, like the giant woman, alien flying saucers, giant ant bug things, people running, robots, and... Just all kinds of weird, cheesy, old sci-fi silliness going on. I love it. What could this possibly have to do with the contents of the book? Well, as usual, it starts out kind of quiet. Look at this. An opening page with not any text at all. I know this isn't the only comic that does this, but since this is one of my favorites, it just stands out. And there's so many books that can't help but just clutter up the page with words everywhere. You don't need words. You can have words, and words can be perfect, but you can also, as a writer, just shut the fuck up and let the story be told by the visuals. Thank you, Warren Ellis. Thank you, John Cassidy. Uh, also, remember, John Cassidy, rest in peace. He passed away not too long ago, and it's a goddamn shame. Um, yeah, like a desert scene. A sun going down, a lizard crawling across the sand there. Comes across a woman's foot in a high heel. And as the lizard passes, a cigarette drops on the ground. This is uh, dated February of 2000, so almost 25 years ago. The Day the Earth Turned Slower, a planetary production. So we got a woman and st standing next to a car. And she's obviously wearing, you know, her outfit, her clothing is, you know, specifically important. Nothing is random or by just happenstance in these books everything is specific she's in clothing from a different era and she's leaning on a <clears throat> i'm not sure what kind of car that is i'm trying to look i'm not great with cars i know some i don't know is it a studebaker sorry i was just watching the uh the muppet movie and fozzy bear was like ah a bear in his natural habitat a studebaker makes me laugh every time anyway she's standing there quietly by herself out in the desert by her car Lights up another smoke. We see a reverse angle on her. She's standing in front of a big structure, building of some kind that looks kind of run down. We see a close up on one of the broken windows and then a bright flash of light crosses it. The light flashes down on her as she looks up. 
a helicopter coming down. I love the use of lighting on here to look like a spotlight coming down. The helicopter's obviously landed, and we got the stars of the book, Elijah Snow, Jakita Wagner, and the drummer. Snow says, my God, look at her. And now we see her, now we're seeing it from their kind of perspective. We didn't see this exactly before at all, but she's got like a glow about her, almost ghostly. And knowing this book, you know, I mean, my first time I read this was 25 years ago, so I'm trying to remember what I may have thought at the time, but being like a ghost, is that what this is? I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, excuse me. God, I hate ads in these books. So the three stars of the book approach the mysterious woman. Jakita says, I'm Jakita Wagner. I think we spoke on the phone. She's just kind of quiet. She doesn't say anything. She says, this is Elijah Snow, and that's our monkey. And she kind of smiles at the joke, kind of breaks the ice. So Jakita says, you're Allison, right? And she says, Allison will do for now. Like, okay. So they look at the structure that she was parked in front of here. And Jakita says, and this is U.S. Science City Zero. And Allison, the ghost lady, says, not on any maps, just like the old Soviet science cities, nowhere towns. I know that I know what you're doing, especially with what you've been doing recently. That skyscraper that was blown up, dramatic kind of excavation, wasn't it? You're not the only archaeologist in town. Jakita says, how do you know that? She says, when you're this far underground, there are ways of moving news around. I've been hiding since 1960. So Snow and Drum are kind of wandering off, looking around. Jakita continues talking to the ghost lady. We see in the background, the helicopter they landed in, suddenly it tips into the ground. The pilot is screaming, freaking out. The helicopter disappears under the sand, and then out from under the sand come giant fucking ants. Giant monster ants. I've said this before, speaking from an artistic perspective. John Cassidy is so good. I love how there's not one sound effect on any of these pages anywhere. It is completely unnecessary. I don't need to hear like a giant ants roar or a bunch of onomatopoeia sound effects of the, the helicopter going under the sand or on the previous page where the helicopter is coming down. I don't need the sound effects of whoop, 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 just to like give the sound of the helicopter. I don't need it. It's so completely unnecessary. And again, this, that's how this comic is built. This is the stylistic kind of choices they make. I'm not saying that that has to apply to every comic everywhere. But man, this is what I like. Anyway, giant ants pop out of the sand. Back to the giant ants. Everyone's looking on. Chiquita, she just literally says, would you look at that? And she's almost got a look of happiness on her face. She tells everyone else, indoors now. Snow says, you're not going to get rid of them alone. She turns to him angrily and says, that's exactly what I'm going to do, Elijah. Now move. So they all take off running. Jaquita's got a kind of happy and almost aggressive look on her face. One of the ants' giant legs stomps down in front of her. She takes off her big trench coat she was wearing. She grabs onto the ant's leg, snaps it off, just rips it off. The ant tumbles off balance into the ground. She lands on top of it, smashing her hand down into the head of it. The one in the background with its mandibles is like spitting goo or something. I don't know that that's what ants do. I don't know enough about insects. But um, Jaquita is just having a good time. This is a very interesting way of um, showing us, illustrating a character trait. This girl is not scared of giant bug monsters. In fact, she's thrilled to be fighting them. This is joy for her. So it lets you know a lot about the character without saying anything, you know, in terms of text boxes. I love it. It's brilliant characterization. It's just a little thing to know about her. We've kind of gotten the idea from her that she's strong, she's caring, she's fearless, she's super strong, and she's super fast. I mean, it's kind of a Wonder Woman-ish thing. I'm not trying to make a, you know, unnecessary comparison, but it's kind of there. So she's happy and wants to fight these things. Flip the page over. There are the giant ants and she's just leaping into battle. I love how she's this little tiny figure right there. Giant ants everywhere. The one that she smacked down is down here in the front. 
I looked at this and I can't help but wonder if uh, there's a page in my uh, Masters of the Universe fan comic in the first book where I have He-Man facing off against Voltron and um, I have like an ending splash page uh, right before the big battle starts where I, it's kind of the same layout. And I don't remember intentionally specifically stealing that from this book, but I wonder if it kind of influenced me because I had He-Man like this leaping into battle and Voltron giant in the background as they kind of went to battle. So I kind of look at this and go, ah, I wonder if that's where I got that from. As I look at this page, I also feel like I want to shout out, as always, the coloring is so damn good. I love the color tones in all of this. Who did the colors? I should know. I think I know, but I don't want to say without. Um, Laura Depoy in Wildstorm Effects with special thanks to Wendy Fouts. Coloring always looks amazing in this. So now, now that she's outside fighting giant ants, uh, Allison, the ghost lady, and Elijah Snow and the drummer, they're inside the structure. She's saying, Allison, the ghost lady, is saying, this is the place. I haven't been back here in 30 years. This is where we made the monster movies. She says, I was killed here. So Snow says, what did they do here, Allison? More to the point, what did they do to you here? And this is the thing about Elijah Snow, if you've been following his character arc in the book, He's uh, been around for a long time. He's got a lot of cool powers. He's very smart. And he's very um, knowledgeable about things. But he's got huge gaps in his memory. And he doesn't know about any of this stuff. He's learning as a new recruit of this team. He's learning about all of this stuff. And he's intensely inquisitive and pushing the team to be more proactive. So he wants to know. He wants to know all these secret, horrible things that are out there so they can shut them down and fix it and solve the problems. Um, and I like that about the character. And that's a theme that Warren Ellis would get into uh, when he was writing The Authority and Planetary. And I actually really like it. So he wants to know what, they do, what did they do to her here. She says, Zero, Science City Zero, this place they're in, was built at the top of the Red Scare. You know what it was like, living in a country driven mad with fear of nothing. He says, yeah, I was here, at least for some of it. She says, you don't look that old. He says, neither do you. She's like, good point. It's a strange world, Mr. Snow. Meanwhile, boom, right through the wall, a giant Anne's head comes crashing through the wall. It's just sitting there as the other three are looking at it. And then Jaquita walks in. She's like, sorry about that. I kicked it a little too hard. She's like covered in goo, big old smile on her face. Snow says, did you have fun? She's like, hell yeah. Got our pilot out too. So that helicopter that got sucked under the sand, she dug out the pilot, saved his life too. So they're all heroes and they're saving lives. So Jaquita says, how are we doing, Allison? She says, I never expected to be back here. I mean, I used to have nightmares about ending up here. Do you have any idea of what happened here? She says, only, Jaquita says, only rumors. So now they go into some black and white flashbacks to show that they're showing this structure, this uh, facility that they're in back when it was in operation to kind of put you in a different time frame uh, that you know you're in a different time and uh, to kind of help let the storytelling make sense. So you see a bunch of soldiers and trucks rolling in. They're unloading people and pointing at them. Uh, and so Allison says city zero was first and foremost an experimental concentration camp for american dissidents they needed warm bodies for what they had planned they wanted to rid us all, all rid they wanted rid of all of us supposed reds under the bed perfect plan they picked up those of us whose disappearances were explainable the drinkers the dopers women who slept with the wrong men they disappeared us brought us here were quite open about the fact that they could do anything they wanted to us and began to change us. And so they show the girl that we're there's the star of the book, like here she is there, and she's up against a wall with a bunch of other people riddled with bullets. Makes you wonder like, well, what's about to happen here? So back in real time, she's walking around, going into different parts of the facility. She says, they shot me, you know, quite literally took me out back of the canteen, put me up against the store walls and shot me, five of them with rifles. And you could see the soldiers fight, you know, getting ready to fire. These two guys are kind of like dead serious. This guy in the middle has got kind of like a scared, sad look on his face. She says, I remember quite distinctly that one of them wet himself when he squeezed the trigger. And then they brought me back just to see if they could. So you could see that they're in this science city 
and they're going to start doing experiments on people, doing weird things just to see if they can. She takes him into another part, this big open room where you see two panels of it. One where it's in the current time where it's old and dilapidated and there's debris and rubble around. But then up here or down there, here in this bottom panel is black and white back in the time when it was being used. All the equipment's going. There's all kinds of people. I like the shot of the scientist's face here. He's got this goggle up close and uh, it's like super zoomed in on his eye. That's kind of a neat kind of effect right there. Um, but she's like, this is the, th this is theater a, this is where they dragged my corpse. I'm told I was still warm when they put me on the table, still leaking weird. It almost seems harmless seeing it all like this. The devil's empty house. She says, I remember the smells first ozone bonfires, and then the light it flickered, flared, sent everything monochrome and then electric blue and then flickered again. The voice sang atomics. Something else, atomic ray, atomic projection, something like that. Atomics. So it shows her on the table, and this is where it suddenly got interesting. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was, it's been interesting for me all the way up to this point, but we hadn't got into the main story points of the characters that I want to know, and here we go. It's got her on the table. She says, I knew I'd died. I'd felt the bullets tear me open, rip me up inside. They don't tell you that, you know, that you can feel the bullets moving inside you, burning channels in your body. You assume a firing, a firing squad death will be quick, but it's not. I finished the scream I started just before I died. The man who operated on me waited patiently until I, began, until I had to breathe again and then said, and then we see this guy, he says, my name is Dr. Randall Dowling. Can you understand me? I brought you back from the dead. Can you understand? So this, Dr. Randall Dowling, this is where I've talked about the villains of this book are an evil, twisted, horrific, horrifically scary version of the Fantastic Four. And this is Reed Richards. And it works so well. If Reed Richards was a conscienceless, soulless monster with infinite mental, mental genius, and weird superhuman abilities. What an unbelievable monster Reed Richards could be. And that's what we're exploring here. This is in the 60s, the era when the Fantastic Four were new. So, and we've seen little bits and pieces of this guy, you know, little moments here, little flashbacks there, and here he is again. So Warren Ellis is building up this character in just little bits and pieces. And every time he shows up, he's in some new place doing some new weird fucked up thing. And to me, it's infinitely fascinating. And it's the, the, the little bits of information doled out make the buildup of the character so fascinating. I get so into it. I love it so much. And the, the team back in regular time, they're like, Dowling, unreal. Snow says, what do you, so what year are we talking about here? 50s? City Zero was an Artemis operation? Is that what you're telling us? She says, no, it was a government operation. These were the early days of the military industrial complex, as well as the complex post-war web of spook shows. There was a woman here, young, Asian. She represented something called the Hark Corporation. And we've been introduced to the Hark family. Um, this girl's either father or grandfather, I'm sorry, I can't remember, worked with uh, some super powered adventurers in the 30s and the 40s. And then this is his progeny. And she's like this super brilliant, um, uh, powerful member of China that is fighting for her nation. She's kind of been portrayed in the little bit that we've seen her as not good, but not evil, just dedicated to her own kind of um, goals. But she's here with the evil Reed Richards character. So she says, how long, she said. She wasn't talking to me, of course. She was talking to Dowling. I got the impression she didn't like him or City Zero. I got the feeling that it was all below her, but necessary, expedient. Anyway, he said, as discussed, Miss Hark, this woman has a radioactive half-life of 50 years. So he's got some kind of technological doodad in his hand, and she's getting up off the table. So they did something atomically with her, some kind of sciency thing. She has a radioactive half-life of 50 years. They brought her back from the dead, reanimated her body. She's still alive somehow, some way. And Anna Hark is here observing everything. 
So Allison continues saying, it wasn't just me, of course. They did something to all of us, all of us that were strong enough to withstand the procedures anyway. So we see this guy right here kind of see through in the internal organs and skeletal structure of his body. She says the screenwriter, pacifist, communist, a drinker, begging the soldiers to shoot him as he moved in and out of visibility. He would have tried to kill himself, but he'd gone blind from the invisibility and the pain was crippling him. So it's like they tried to do like an invisible man thing to this guy, but it's just caused him such unbelievable agony and pain that he just suffered and died. Then there's like a man that's like a giant. A, some giant guy and the soldiers have like cables around their hand, his hands. His body's all distorted. It looks like he's in pain and screaming. She says, the disgraced officer. We heard his bones stretching from beyond the compound when they put the treatment on him. I developed a lover in the city medical corps. He said that the autopsy revealed a normal sized brain hanging in a web of nerve tissue like cables in a skull several feet across. So... That's creepy. You got these dogs with glowing eyes and lightning bolts coming out of their eyes there. Uh, she continues, at night, atomic dogs prowled the compound in the distance. We could always hear the ants locked in their flexing cages at the edge of the city, shrieking like starving babies. Then we see some other kind of presumably experiments that were you know, worked on here. Distorted faces, weird mutations. She says, we would try to sleep crammed in unisex barracks, but it was so hard. There was a man whose brain had been replaced by an atomic snowflake field who was channeling the consciousness of someone on another planet who would whisper obscenities all night, never repeating himself. And then there's this uh, like giant woman, kind of like on the cover. He's like, what is it that show, that old silly show attack of the 50 foot woman something like that there she is just lying on the ground looks like she's presumably dead maybe they shot her dead um she continues they they laughed to look at us the soldiers and everyone else without the right need to know we were the big joke dirty reds being used as guinea pigs for the special anti-red super army to come this is the Hark helicopter leaving the compound. We see that there. And so she continues, but the actual joke was even worse. There was no real red threat. They were as afraid of us as we were of them. The people who built City Zero knew it, but that's not why they built City Zero. The red threat angle just got them the initial funding and the secrecy they needed. City Zero was simply about testing the human body to the limits of the available technology it was about seeing what they could get away with doing to us. So you see them doing all these experiments on these guys, person trapped in a corner, just horrible experiments going on. All the horrible things that a twisted Reed Richards could do. So back in real time, the girl Allison says, can we go outside? She continues, for me personally, I can't always be angry at them. You never get tired of looking at the stars, do you, Mr. Snow? And I've seen them a lot more than I otherwise might. But what they did to everyone else. City Zero was left very quickly. Dr. Dowling had more than one change of fortune before the end of the decade. Some of the information is still here. Trapped in machines, buried in abandoned books. For all their sakes, for our sake, use it. So she wants them to know that this facility existed. It was secret. Some horrible things happened. And if they could dig up any information that they can about what was going on to use it to stop the evil people in the world who are still out there alive to this day doing terrible things to people. That's what this woman wants them to do. She says... I could have done this a while ago, but I'm a coward. I wanted to live for as long as I could, you see. It was only half a life, but I wanted it. So she kind of looks at them. She's still glowing. And then suddenly she's like radioactive half-life of 50 years. Time's up. I'm so glad I met you. And then poof, she just vanishes, disappears. And her little ghost clothes are on the ground. Elijah Snow just looks down. Touches it, looks to the sky as their little energy just kind of like dissipates into the sky, into the universe. The end. Story's over. It's such a weird way of telling stories. It's like you're given just little bits of information, but not a lot of extra exposition. If this is like your first issue of this book, 
it could be incredibly interesting and frustrating if you're like, what the fuck is going on? Who are all these people? It kind of flies in the face of the concept where I've talked about, for example, when I was reviewing those old classic X-Men issues by Claremont and John Byrne, and I get kind of mildly frustrated every time we see the X-Men team, and they're always repeating who they are and what they do, and it's always re-explaining it. But their point is, is to explain to you who they are and what they're kind of what their goals are and what their their powers are and all that type of stuff. It makes sense. It gets old if you're reading them all in a row. But um, so in that kind of respect, a book like this would, could potentially be very weird and confusing to a person. I'd like to think that for me, I'd be like, I don't know what's going on, but it's so beautifully drawn and so interesting in the story and the weird shit that's going on. I'd be interested in seeking out everything else. But like I said, I can understand if some people would get kind of frustrated with this i don't know i love everything about it as a reading experience reading it all together in one big run um i think it's amazing it's fascinating as hell and i love everything about it so i hope you enjoyed these uh my planetary reviews never get that many views and i'm kind of it's kind of sad to me i'd like this thing to get a lot more kind of um exposure to it it's kind of interesting the things that kind of pick up a lot of views you know get a thousand or two thousand views and then these ones are the two or three hundred range it doesn't seem that people kind of respond to these very much and i don't know sometimes i like to think my enthusiasm and excitement for it would be contagious but it's apparently it's not but i'm doing these for me i love them and uh can't wait to get through the whole series issue 10 is one of my favorite uh, i can't wait to get to that one it's one of the most like well told and like sad and depressing comics I've ever read in my life. If I if I was to be told, like, what's a book that really affected you, you know, like an emotional kind of response? Issue 10 has a story in it that's just like, oh my God, that's so depressing. Um, and it's really interesting and we'll, we'll get to it. But anyway, Planetary, Issue 8. I love this shit so much. I love it. And uh, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. I will see you next time.